Hey there, marketing researchers. In this video, we're going to go over key categories of primary data and their uses in marketing research. So <clears throat> we introduce ourselves to the idea of primary data collection. Of course, what we're talking about here is the type of data marketers typically collect when they are answering their own research question with their own research efforts. Given that many marketers typically try to answer similar types of questions with their research projects, it goes to follow that we have similar types of categories of data. So I'll introduce you to some of those categories and provide illustrative examples. I do want to mention that today's conversation uh, is focusing on primary data collection when we're focusing on collecting data about consumers. Of course, marketers don't only collect data about consumers. Sometimes we collect primary data about other brands that we might be competing with, data about companies, other organizations, if we're B2B or industrial marketers. We may actually collect information at the country level, product, uh, individual product categories, or aggregate industries. What we see here is what I call the wheel of variables. I don't think anyone else in the world calls it that. But what you'll notice here in the center here is behavior. All of these other variables, these are all measures that we often capture about consumers. However, all of them are ultimately trying to serve the grand purpose of understanding, predicting, and controlling human behavior. So that's why we have this wide ring of variables surrounding the central type of primary data that we often collect, which is actual consumer behavior. I want us to never lose sight that when we're collecting all this other information, it's always in service to ultimately trying to understand consumer behavior. Okay, let's first introduce ourselves to demographic and socioeconomic variables. Demographic and socioeconomic variables are the type of variables that are commonly used to characterize the composition of human populations. I'm sure that you are familiar with the word of demographics and you're probably familiar with the word of socioeconomics. Um, in this case, we're talking about the variables that often inform socioeconomic study. What's very interesting about this is that there is actually no universal definition of what constitutes a demographic variable versus not a demographic variable, except for common practice. In fact, if you go Google right now and look for information about what defines a demographic variable, you'll notice that in most cases, the definitions aren't really a definition. Instead, they're just providing a list of examples of those types of variables that we study. With that said, there are a few general traits of a demographic variable. First, demographic variables tend to be objectively verifiable traits of individuals rather than the internal mental states like satisfaction, loyalty that we may collect in other categories of marketing uh, data. So common examples of demographic variables include age, income, family size, occupation, education, and so on. We're familiar with these types of variables because they are commonly collected by government agencies, uh, not just not just business organizations. Now, a subset of demographic variables are socioeconomic variables. So these are the variables that are often used in relation to determining someone's particular socioeconomic status. There's a variety of different research approaches to identifying where somebody falls on social and economic stratification in a particular space. In terms of actually measuring socioeconomic status, there are three key ingredients that usually show up in some combination. First, someone's educational status or educational attainment. Next, someone's income is a common measure as part of socioeconomic status. However, while income is often used as a measure of socioeconomic status, it's been recommended by academics and experts in the field of socioeconomic status to actually use wealth as a better indicator of someone's position uh, in the socioeconomic system. Lastly, and not always present as part of socioeconomic status measurements, is someone's occupation. The idea here is if you hold aside someone's income or their educational status and focus strictly just on the occupation, different occupations have different levels of social prestige associated with them. One example of this is nurses in the United States are considered one of the most respected positions in the entire United States. So if you took a similar um, level of income and educational attainment, but for a different occupation than nurse, the suggestion here would be that because of the prestige associated um, with being in the nursing profession, that say, those individuals with similar educational and income outcomes wouldn't be at the same, quite at the same level. Here we have a measurement measuring someone's age, highest level of education that they've completed, and here's their combined annual household income. So all three of these would comprise types of demographic measures where the education level and the household income 
measurement level would be indicators that we could use to determine socioeconomic status. I just said earlier that one of the things that characterizes most demographic variables is that they tend to be objective traits about individuals. But in reality, measuring demographics can be much more complex than that. Think about the standard race and or ethnicity measure that you commonly see at the end of marketing research surveys. Sometimes, because measures of race and ethnicity are so common, it is tempting for people to think they are simply objective, immutable traits of an individual. However, that is not so. They are social constructions. The incorrect notion of race as something objective has long been noted by great thinkers like W.E.B. Du Bois. More recently, biologists have more thoroughly dismantled the idea that race somehow meaningfully organizes humans into distinctive genetic groupings. However, it should be noted that race and ethnicity as social constructs in no way diminishes their power and influence in the social world that humanity has constructed. But what it does mean for our present conversation about measurement of human demographics is that it can be quite challenging to determine the one correct way to measure race and ethnicity, especially since race and ethnicity are almost universally measured by having individuals fill out some sort of survey questions or questions on a form. As noted by Professor Jennifer DeVere Brody of Stanford, race and ethnicity are also often substituted for one another due to how an individual chooses to identify and the historical impact on the perception of the two terms. Meanwhile, the Stanford Gendered Innovations website notes that race and ethnicity are complex terms and often used interchangeably. These terms were initially separated to designate race as a biological quality and ethnicity as a cultural phenomenon. This distinction mirrors efforts to distinguish sex and gender. Unlike sex and gender, however, there's little agreement on core distinctions between race and ethnicity. With this complexity in mind, let's look at how the U.S. Census has approached measuring race and ethnicity throughout the years. I must also note that the history of the U.S. Census and race and ethnicity measurement is complex, fraught, and filled with many important details that are simply outside the scope of this immediate discussion. I encourage you to check out some of the links to content about the U.S. Cen the Census history that I've added alongside this video to learn more. The U.S. Census uses a distinct definition of race and ethnicity. The U.S. Census attempts to distinguish race and ethnicity as distinct concepts. The Census Bureau defines race as a person's self-identification, with one or more social groups. On the other hand, they define ethnicity specifically as whether a person is or is not of Hispanic descent. With the U.S. Census's distinct operationalization of how to define race and ethnicity in mind, let's take a look at the 2010 U.S. Census race and ethnicity question, and then we'll talk about some experiments that they conducted between 2010 and 2020 in an attempt to improve the questionnaire item for the 2020 Census. Uh, here, so what you're looking at in this slide here is the standard uh, census version from 2010 where questions related to ace, race and ethnicity were asked and there's a few notable traits here I'm going to point out to you by way of looking at one of the alternative versions that they experimented with literally they did an AB experiment they had the control version and then they with a random subset of the US population they actually use this experimental version to test for differences in responses and this is just one of the experimental versions, but let's take a look at some of the differences here. First, they make explicit that you can check more than one box, that if you're of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin. They, uh, they directly offer some new examples. So in the previous example, it was Argentinian, Colombian, Dominican, Nicaraguan, and uh, Salvadoran, and Spaniard. And here we have Dominican, Salvadoran, Colombian, and Spaniard. For identifying someone's race, for white, it's no longer without any examples. It now includes German, Irish, Lebanese, Egyptian, and so on. And a big change, and this came after uh, uh, some lengthy complaints uh, in, for, in 2010, uh, for black or African American, they dropped a very contentious word in the 2010 census, and that's likely for many of us, it strikes us as inappropriate that this word would be included on the census form. There's actually an interesting conversation about this that people from the census report and what they found was, uh, in many cases, there's a subset, it tends to be an older African-American audience, that they would actually write in this word uh, as a way to describe themselves. And by virtue of them writing it in, they thought that this was appropriate to keep in the 2010 version of the census uh, because it was a way that some individuals in the United States did choose to identify themselves. But of course, by keeping all three of these designations on a single line, for those individuals who identify as black or African-American and find this term uh, insulting, derogatory, and appropriate, 
this is obviously causing uh, distress for them. So this was a bit. This was a big change for the census going forward, and it won't be in the 2020 version of the census that's coming out. After extensive testing, the U.S. Census arrived at this version of how to measure race and ethnicity in the 2020 U.S. Census. Notice how it attempts to solve multiple difficulties associated with measuring race and ethnicity. First, with respect to the distinct definition the census uses for ethnicity, notice that the ethnicity question allows people to identify in multiple different categories that it might consider Hispanic, although the word itself may not be used by that particular individual in terms of how they identify themselves. In addition, notice the individual is capable of responding to multiple checkboxes as appropriate per their own self-identification. Also notice the opportunity for a person to write in their own open-ended response. For the census's race question, again notice the opportunity for the individual to respond to multiple categories. Also notice that for individuals who identify as white, they have the opportunity to respond in an open-ended fashion for other identifications that might be appropriate based on their own self-identity. Same is true for Black or African American, American Indian or Alaskan Native, other Asian groups, or some other race. As a practical matter for those individuals who will be codifying the U.S. Census, in the spot where you see individuals writing some other race answer or other open-ended text box answers, it may be true that based on an open-ended response, the U.S. Census may recode an individual into a new category once they actually process the information. However, at the time of actual data collection, this questionnaire item version attempts to respect individuals' abilities to be able to self-identify in the way that they characterize themselves. We as marketing researchers still frequently use demographic uh, and socioeconomic variables despite some of the difficulty associated with properly measuring them. One of the main reasons that we collect demographic and socioeconomic variables when we're collecting primary data is because it does often afford us the ability to compare our results to results from other secondary data sources. Because demographic and socioeconomic, socioeconomic variables are collected almost in such a standard form in so many other forms of research, we can then use our own results and map them onto those other results, hopefully creating a bigger, richer tapestry to answer questions related to our marketing research problem. Another use of demographic and socioeconomic variables are that they often are used to set very initial boundaries of market segments. So these are very broad, course segments. For example, you may think about the Nielsen PRISM system that they used to segment U.S. households. Although there were over 60 precise detailed market segments, the initial way that they sliced apart those segments were based on three demographic and socioeconomic variables, and that was where people lived, the stage in the life they were at, and the degree of wealth that they possessed. From there, once those initial, those initial variables were used to create initial market segments, then other variables were used to then drill down deeper. 